Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Larissa Sansour. I'm a visual artist. I was born in Jerusalem um, and grew up in Bethlehem in Palestine. Today I'll be making, uh, talking about my most recent work called Nation Estate and a censorship scandal it caused just about a year ago. In early autumn 2011, I was nominated for an international photography award, the Lacoste Elysee Prize. The prize was administered by Swiss Musée de l'Elysée and sponsored by the French fashion company Lacoste. I did not apply for this prize. I was nominated by the museum with no prior contact and asked to produce three photo sketches for a new project. Eight nominees competed for a 25,000 euro award to complete their project. All artists were given complete artistic freedom to interpret the theme of the competition, la joie de vivre. I decided to develop a project I had been thinking about for a long time, the nation estate. The idea is quite simple. With Israeli settlement, expansion confiscating more and more Palestinian land, eventually there will be no land left for a viable Palestinian state. My project takes this scenario to the extreme and presents a vertical solution to statehood. So, as you can see, this is a poster uh, that's reminiscent of a uh, famous Palestinian poster, uh, but instead of Jerusalem, you see the nation estate. The first sketch introduces the lobby of the nation estate building. Each city has its own floor, and trips between cities are made by elevator. The second sketch is the Jerusalem floor seen from the elevator. The third sketch is a scene from an apartment overlooking the actual city of Jerusalem. The skyscraper was supposedly built uh, just outside of real Jerusalem. I submitted these sketches and was congratulated by the museum. No concerns about the politics of the piece were raised. About a month later, <laughs> About a month later, I received a phone call informing me that Lacoste had decided to exclude my work and revoke my nomination. The explanation I got was that Lacoste found the work too pro-Palestinian. On top of it all, I was asked to approve a statement saying I had withdrawn from the competition voluntarily. So not only was my work censored, I was also asked to cover up the censorship. After weighing my options, I decided that I had to expose this, and I released a statement presenting my case. Overnight, I found myself at the center of a media storm. <laughs> I... <laughs> I received support from journalists, activists, bloggers, artists, and other people from all over the world. Cartoons even emerged. I gave what felt like hundreds of interviews to newspapers, blogs, television, and websites. Activists demonstrated in front of Lacoste flagship stores. At first, the museum and Lacoste denied any wrongdoing, claiming that there was no political motivation. But after seeing the immense public outcry against censorship, the museum finally decided to cancel the competition altogether and side with the artist instead of the corporate sponsor. My inbox and Facebook page immediately filled up with congratulations from artists, activists, and supporters from all over the world. And it felt like a big victory to freedom of artistic expression. Lacoste's attempt to silence the work had quite the opposite effect. Not only did the act of censorship get exposed, as all that is banned is desired, the attention the work received helped me gather enough funding to complete the project as intended. So the original sketches have now become an actual photo series. The lobby sketch became this image. The Jerusalem sketch became this image. And the image of my apartment watering the olive tree became this. 
But most importantly, I also managed to complete the science fiction short film that was my original intention for this project. It was done a few months ago. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to show the work here today in this forum as one of the first venues. I'll play this film now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Nadia Plesner. I'm a visual artist from Denmark and I'm here to give a very short recap of what happened the last six years of my life. Um, because in order to explain to you what happened with one of my artworks, I need to go back to 2006, where I moved from Denmark to the Netherlands to study art at the Art Academy in Amsterdam. Um, the life that I imagined there, the artworks I would make, the people I would meet, uh, was not exactly how it unfolded. And a series of events that is too long to explain here today um, led me to living in a caravan in the countryside in Holland uh, after a traffic accident, completely uh, broken to pieces, unable to walk with a constant uh, headache, um, no school, uh, not much of a social life, and just confined in this little caravan. It was a very uh, uh, intense period of my life. Uh, I was very depressed, I had a lot of pain. And yet, in that period, uh, something started that got me on the road that I'm on today and made me realize what I wanted to do with my art as soon as I got better. Because while I was in bed in this caravan, I was reading a newspaper, and inside this newspaper, there was a very small update on the situation in Darfur in Sudan, mentioning uh, what was going on, that people were still being killed um, three years into the genocide that started in 2003. And then on the opposite page was a full article about Paris Hilton going to prison. And this was a serious newspaper. And as I watched it and I read it, I realized that my the frustration I had felt before on similar events, uh, the way I felt that some parts of the media gave more and more space to entertainment and gossip and less and less space to important news updates, was something that I wanted to do something about as soon as I got better. So I started brainstorming about how I could make a work that could um, sort of deal with the disappearing boundaries between the editorial and advertising departments of the media if I could make a drawing that could sort of uh, be a test or sort of experiment in how you could influence the mass media if you use some of the tools that are normally used to get a lot of attention. The result was this, was this drawing. It's called Simple Living, and it was simply an attempt to raise awareness about the situation in Darfur by pimping one of the child victims with some of the items that are used by American celebrities. The big designer bag, a small dog dressed in a pink outfit, and then put it back into this gigantic flow of images and see what happens. I had this image printed on t-shirts that I started selling to raise money for an organization called Divest for the Four. And as I started to sell the first t-shirts and this image started to spread out in the media and people started debating which way we were going with Western media and how it could be influenced, uh, I received a very, very thick envelope from Paris and France. Uh, inside was an 80 page lawsuit from Louis Vuitton's head office <laughs> telling me that they had noticed my campaign, and as much as they appreciated my efforts, they could in no way allow me to use their brand in this way. So they asked me to stop selling the t shirts immediately, take this image off my website, uh, sign a letter that I would stop on that day, and fax it back to them. Uh, since this piece of work was 
sort of what made me come out of my sick bed. It was what gave me the energy to go to my rehabilitation classes and so on. And it was really the, the one thing that kept me going. I was in no way ready to just give up just like that. And I was very infuriated with this letter and the way that these 80 pages portrayed me as a cold, manipulating bitch hijacking this brand to be famous. I didn't recognize the way I was described and I felt like I had not been heard at all. Louis Vuitton had taken this case to the court in Paris and they had an ex parte uh, verdict uh, from the judge, which means that they basically ran the case without me. It's normally a procedure that is used to shut down copy factories in China or things like that, but in this case they used it uh, against an artist, which is very uncommon. <coughs> Nevertheless, the verdict was that this was illegal and I should pay 15,000 euros per day that I would continue to show this image online, or in a gallery, or in a t-shirt, or whatever. So the clock was ticking from the date I received the letter. Of course, this was uh, upsetting news, and I felt scared. Uh, at the same time, I also felt very infuriated and, uh, and violated on my artistic freedom. And I spoke to my father, who is a journalist, and he said to me, if you don't want to back down, you should get a lawyer and call the press. So that's what I decided to do. I called a Dutch newspaper called the Volkskrant and I explained this case. The next morning they ran a super small piece about it without an image. And then it spread out like nothing I've ever seen before. So all of a sudden it was everywhere. The fact that it got media attention uh, helped me a lot because I could feel that Louis Vuitton started to act a little different now that people were watching. They had to be a little bit more careful. Um, Meanwhile, I received a ton of letters from other artists around the world <laughs> who also had used uh, the Louis Vuitton pattern in their own works. So this is not completely representative of the people that contacted me. But I got the idea that many artists had indeed been threatened by Louis Vuitton and they all decided to back down. So they wrote to me, they either didn't have the money to fight this, or they didn't dare to fight it, or whatever reason they had, they didn't fight it. So they said to me, please continue, because we are a lot of people that have been harassed this way. Um, I happen to have a friend in New York who saw the opening of the show that included uh, an electrical chair with the Louis Vuitton pattern, and the chainsaw and weapons. And my friend contacted this artist and asked him, did you also have problems with Louis Vuitton? And he said, no, actually, they called me and wished me good luck with the selling. <laughs> <laughs> so for some reason, these weapons are not uh, against the, the brand, or I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that, but he didn't have any problems. Um, so meanwhile, this was going on in the media, and Louis Vuitton was pressuring me very hard for a meeting. They said, you have to come to Paris, to the Louis Vuitton mansion, and meet with us. We need to talk about this and see if we can find some common grounds. I got the help from two lawyers, and we went to Paris, to this mansion. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to take photos, so this is just an image from Mexico. <laughs> but <laughs> we went inside in this uh, gigantic mansion where everything inside has this pattern, from the carpets to the couch, the glasses, the cups, the artworks, the pets, Everything had this pattern, and it occurred to me that it would be difficult to have a real conversation about this art piece <laughs> within this frame that was so clearly on one side. Um, they took me around the mansion, very beautiful. They took me through the rose garden, and then in the end we came to this small workshop where an old French guy was sitting making one bag with his hands. And they said to me, as you can see, we're just a small family business. <laughs> uh, after the tour, we went to sit down in the living room and we had coffee and there were ten waiters giving out little cakes. Uh, and we talked about the case and they, ex they explained to me uh, their concerns about this artwork. They said, we're not responsible for what's happening in the four, so we do not wish to be related to it. And the way you have been acting like a parasite on our brand has been very disturbing to the people that work for us. It has led to broken families. 
I said, well, I'm very sorry about that, but you have to realize that this artwork is not specifically about Louis Vuitton as a brand. It's about the way the media works and uh, in the way that the media has responded to this work in this case. Clearly, I had some sort of a point because it is now proving itself. Uh, one of the people working for them told me, look, this will be very easy. If you just decide today to stop using this drawing, take everything away from your website, then uh, it would be a very good decision for you because we are very powerful people. So you would like to be friends with us. Just imagine a young artist like yourself, if you have us backing you, there is no limits to what you can do. The only thing you have to do is to sign this paper that you will never do it again, and you have to give a public apology. Then uh, the bad cop attorney took over and he said, but if you don't stop this, then I will tell you what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to crush you completely financially. This bill that is already counting, it's on 200,000 euros already. I have my fees, it's about 50,000 euros. Then he listed a lot of other financial things. He said, and that's just the money thing. If you think it's been stressful up until now with letters and phone calls and this, it will only get worse. We will put on as many full-time attorneys as we have to to crush you, and believe me, you don't have a chance. We can also use our power to make sure that, as an artist, you will never ever be able to exhibit at any good gallery or museum in your life. And maybe the press likes you now, but we can change that by feeding them false stories. So this was all very warming to me. Um, and I got more and more furious and as we talked, and I asked my attorney, can they really do this? And he said, well, they've been known to do it before. He said, it's a problem because if we go to court, it can take eight to ten years. And besides that, it will absorb all your energy for those eight to ten years. It's also going to cost you a lot of money. And the lawyer fee is already on 15,000 euros now, and you're a student, so I don't know how you're expecting to pay that, but you can see it will be difficult. He said, it's too bad you didn't make an oil painting. Then you could have done what you wanted. So I went home and I thought about this, and it seemed like the best thing I could do was to sort of regroup my art. I stopped selling the t-shirts, and then I started making a painting. Um, I didn't want to just paint the simple living drawing into a canvas. It seemed like not the way to go. Then I thought, okay, if I'm going to make it into a painting, I'm going to make it into a complete work. And as I started thinking about political paintings, I immediately thought of Picasso's Guernica. So I figured, what if I make a modern version of Guernica called the Fornica, and then I paint the same things that I wanted to put in the simple living drawing. So after one and a half years, I completed the Fornica in the same size as the original painting. It's three and a half meters high and almost eight meters long. And besides the simple living boy as a centerpiece, which I of course wanted to include, I also painted some of the celebrity gossip stories that got a lot of media attention in the same time period as the genocide has been going on in uh, the four. And some of the things that I thought should have made headline news. For example, that the Sudanese president, Omar al-Bashir, he purchased uh, Russian bomber planes, and then he had them painted white and stenciled with the UN logo before they flew in over villages and bombed them. So you can imagine how the people must have felt when they thought, oh, now the help is finally coming, only to realize that it was bombers. Um, so some of these things I tried to include in the painting, and then it was exhibited in Copenhagen in January 2011. Um, during the course of the show, we had a lot of great debate. People were very open to this, and we, uh, we talked and we discussed, and a lot of things happened during this mo that month. So I returned to Holland, super exhausted and happy. Uh, and when I came home, I found a new uh, thick envelope. <laughs> and I recognized it, and I thought, oh, here we go again. So while I had been in Copenhagen doing the show, uh, Louis Vuitton had went to court this time in The Hague, again without me. And again, a judge had ruled that this painting was illegal, and I should again pay, this time 5,000 euros per day, that I would continue to show the painting. It also uh, included a letter from a plaintiff that had been ordered to go to my house and collect any sort of item I must have in my home with any sort of Louis Vuitton-looking pattern on it. T-shirts, posters, sketches, the painting, everything could be taken away. Um, this time, I just thought, okay, enough is enough. 
this is clearly an artwork. There's no way they can argue that it's fashion or it's anything else. So I wanted to fight it. So again, I contacted the media. Again, they supported me massively. And the first thing we did was to take the painting away from the gallery and into sort of hiding space because they had now the court's order that they could confiscate it. Then a Danish museum called Hart stepped in and they said, OK, this is ridiculous. We want to take this painting, put it in the museum and we will protect it. So that was absolutely amazing for me that they, they stepped up and they, they also acknowledged that it was an artwork um, to go against that Louis Vuitton said that it was a Louis Vuitton product. Um, after I decided to go to court this time and to fight it, of course it was, um, it was tough and I was scared, but I was very moved by the fact that so many people reached out to me with emails and phone calls and letters. Some sent me postcards. Um, the whole art community sort of stood up with me. And actually it was even more than the first time around because people reacted in a way where they said like, okay, first time it was stupid, but now it's like completely ridiculous. And then suddenly something happened that artists and cartoonists, they decided to support me in a new way. They figured if we all start painting the bag, then she's not alone. It had to come, this one, I think. <laughs> and then, as we were preparing to go to court, a seven-meter-high simple living boy appeared on a building in Maastricht over the night. So, in all these various ways, people were very supportive to me, and they constantly reached out to me and let me know, just move on, you're not alone, which was exactly what I needed at that moment to have the guts to go through with it. Then, uh, in May 2011, Finally, we came to the day where we had to meet in court, and this was then over the three years that it went by from the first drawing. It was my first time to express to a judge why I made this art piece, what it meant to me, why I figured that it should be allowed, etc. And a lot of fellow artists, they went with me to the courthouse, and they had made these badges that they were handing out to people coming to support me. So we wore the badges, and we went inside, and... Uh, Honestly, I was very, very scared to sit there. It felt uh, extremely weird to sit in front in this room uh, with five Louis Vuitton representatives lined up with all their translators and people looking mean to me. And we sat there and then we had insisted that we needed a one-to-one -one print of the painting inside the courtroom as evidence. Um, <laughs> The people working in the court, they told me that it was uh, by far the largest piece of evidence ever committed in any case. <laughs> so we brought it in, we put it up, and then uh, everything that had been going on in my mind and, and, and it, within this, the course of this case, I had 45 minutes with my attorney to express it to the judge. At that day, the final bill, or the bill so far, was at 485,000 euros. So, of course, I was also a little bit worried that I would have to pay that if things went wrong. Um, but we expressed why we thought it was important that I would have the freedom of speech to show this work, that it should not be confiscated, I should be allowed to use it and show it around the world. Then they had 45 minutes to prove to the judge why it shouldn't be allowed, that I was uh, mean and manipulative, uh, they mentioned a paragraph that is something about parasitic behavior, <laughs> eating off the precious flower of the Louis Vuitton brand, etc., etc. Uh, so we explained as good as we could. It went very fast. Um, and then by the end of the day, it was sort of mixed emotions because you don't get the verdict right away. We had to wait four weeks. So within those four weeks, it was... You know, you go through it in your head over and over and over. You think, did I say it the right way? Did the judge understand it? Uh, what will happen if I have to pay this money? And what should I do with my art? And then finally, after a month, 
I was waiting all day to get the call from the attorney. They said they would know by two o'clock and it was five minutes to two. And then my phone rang and the attorney just yelled like, yeah, we won, we won. <laughs> so the judge had explained in his verdict that in this case, it was a conflict between two rights, the right to protect your brand and the right to express yourself freely. And in this case, the right to express yourself freely weighed more. So therefore, he quashed the first verdict it, it entirely, uh, meaning that now I'm free to show both works in any shape or form I wish, wherever I want to do it, which is, of course, amazing, I think. Uh, not just for my work, but also for all the other artists that have been threatened <laughs> not to show their works. Um, while we were in the courtroom, Louis Vuitton constantly kept talking about or trying to prove that it was indeed it was possible to show this, to express what I wanted to show with this uh, work without using the bag. But for me, that's not the point at all. You can express everything you want in any way you want it, but for me, the point is that artists should be allowed to express the way they want to do it, regardless of what authority wants them to do it in a different manner. Um, this has been an important case because now it's used in cases like it uh, to prove... Um, it sort of it fought back and gained a little more territory for the artists uh, instead of for the corporations. And to end this, I just want to say that I feel very honored to be here today with all these very courageous and brave people. And what I have been through was more stress and financial threats, but I really strongly believe in how important it is to stand up against uh, the authorities that try to silence artworks, regardless of who they are. And in the West where I work, capitalism has really become uh, a strong player, and so it's also very important to keep fighting for our right to express ourselves the way we want to. Uh, and this conference and this way of joining forces and teaming up is, for me, really the way to do it. We need free art, and we need to free Pussy Riot. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Well, uh, if, you, if you have really mighty enemies, you need many good friends. And uh, so it's, it's very cool to be here and uh, to listen to all the stories and to see how many brave people there are out there. I'm a filmmaker um, and also a journalist. Um, and in my profession, I try to tell stories that interest me, um, that intrigues me in many ways. And... Um, Coming from a country like Sweden, uh, which I do, you don't really think about the, the limits, the borders, or what you can't tell or not tell. But then I did a film about banana workers suing the biggest fruit company in the world, Dole Food Company. Um, I went to Nicaragua to research the story, I found the story, I found a good way to tell it. Um, I followed a court case in LA, it was a public court case, all the, everybody was there, all the big newspapers and so on. So I thought this was kind of, why should they hate me? Um, I did a film, we worked for, for two years, very hard work as always, and then we were invited to premiere it at the Los Angeles Film Festival. And just a month before this world premiere, we opened up our webpage, and then we published the movie trailer. And uh, let's play the trailer. Cada día que una persona muere, que trabajó en la bananera y fue expuesto a este químico, es una victoria más para la Dole Food Company. Es una victoria más cada vez que uno falle. I do not like when other people are exploited. I've never liked it since I was a little kid. I never liked the big guy picking the little guy. Did you have any information at all that there was a chemical at work that could affect your fertility? No, no. 
Nunca lo dieron, huh? They never told us anything about that. Did you ever notice an unusual odor? Yes, of course. Did anyone ever tell you that if you could smell that chemical, you were breathing too much of it, that it could hurt you? No. No. This is bigger than just a case. This is the very first time ever that agricultural workers from a third world nation are heard in a United States court. It's kind of the end product of what we uh, produce basically all over the world. We have an American corporation overseas presenting itself as the face of America. You will not find one sentence, one thought, one concern for the effect of this chemical on their workers, even after they knew. The claim that's being made now is a very nasty claim. It's a very nasty claim. Ya queda más una alma más que se la llevaron esta pananera. Su conciencia, realmente su conciencia es como es como una guerra. Hace poco que están pagando hasta 300 dólares por un afectado. Ustedes que están escuchando este programa, oigan mi voz, no firmen nada. This gentleman, before he ever stepped foot on a farm, was infertile. You have a liar here. And you have so many examples of that with these plants. Terrible. Man, in four hours, they throw a lot of issues into the air. As far as I'm concerned, I want a verdict. I don't want that process stopped. We're not calling them for lunch. I want a verdict. And they got a verdict. Uh, Dole was found uh, liable of malice, and they had to pay the workers. But of course, this is a legal case. It's a legal case. It was ongoing for over 30 years, so there was an appeal, and it, there were new turns and twists in, in a court case. So when I published this movie, Trader, Dole Food Company took it to court and showed it to the judge and wanted to, an injunction against the film. They didn't get it, uh, because the Dutch judge said there was something called a First Amendment in the US. Instead, they sent us a package. It wasn't 80, it was actually 200 pages. <laughs> um, and telling us to withdraw the film, close the website, they didn't only send it to us, they sent it to every single sponsor of the LA Film Festival and also to the US broadcaster involved in the project. And this means that the same package went to the head of New York, uh, LA Times, the head of American Airlines and head of many other major corporations. So you can imagine all the phone calls that were ongoing and all the lawyers that suddenly got some extra hours paid, uh, including our lawyer, which we now needed to have. I thought in the beginning, wow, this is interesting. Um, now I will be together with the, the people from the festival. They're all really well connected in Hollywood and famous people. And the broadcaster, wow, we are a great team. What I didn't think about was that when you attack somebody with a lawyer, normally if you're a big corporation, you also have a media spin prepared. This media spin was Cuban-American immigrant lawyer is blackmailing a very nice American corporation. And now a Swedish very naive filmmaker comes and tries to make this crook into a hero. It was a quite funny story. Can you imagine one of these do-gooders, filmmakers, poor lovers is doing a huge mistake? That story was out everywhere. It was like a joke at lunch uh, or dinner parties. Not only on, you know, in the, on the business party, but also within the documentary community. So a lot of people in my own world believed that I had done a bad job. That story was really well sold, and it meant that it was really hard for me to get support. So I was actually not in a good team. I was kicked out of competition, and 
a whole new story started to, and when I, I mean, my lawyer told me, if you go to LA, you have to expect getting delivered a lawsuit. I felt that I, if I didn't go, it would be kind of almost betraying the people whose story I was about to carry to the world. And, and, and it was actually the banana workers' message that I wanted to get out. So I couldn't back down. I had to go to LA. And I said, if I go to LA and they want to paper me, I want at least to have it on camera. So I actually also brought a camera crew. So I didn't know at that time that I, that I was doing a new film, but I, I actually ended up doing a new film. So let's have a look at the trailer for that film. Dole Foods is suing a Swedish filmmaker for wanting to show a fraudulent documentary slamming the company. Wow. Malmö filmaren Fredrik Gärten stäms av det amerikanska bananföretaget Dole. Företaget hävdar att filmen Bananas är en bluff. It's totally crazy that you in the biggest democracy in the world can't even show this film. Six weeks ago it was okay, now it's not okay because of blah blah blah. What is this? What's well, a scare tactic? The film is based on a sham. That's the point. But you haven't seen the film. I've already told you no, Charlotte. So you're fighting against this incredibly bizarre situation where people are saying the film is wrong and they haven't seen it. Your film is wrapped up into a much bigger cause for Dole. Okay. Their cause is to get rid of billions of dollars worth of litigation that's pending against them because they kept using poisonous chemicals. Mm. So this is a cheap investment for them. I stämningen kräver de att filmen ska läggas ner, hemsidan ska läggas ner och att jag aldrig mer ska uttala mig i frågan. We feel like the film stands on its own and is very, very defensible. These guys are clearly trying to be aggressive if they can. They're attacking you as a filmmaker. They're attacking the film. You see this? This is the front page of the LA Business Journal. Oh, cool. Documentary turns mm -hmm. Doe Fold into hero despite evidence that he fabricated facts oh, of court case. And the writer hasn't even seen the film. We have a media that is corrupted by power. You have corporate ownership from the top, you have corporate advertising coming in from the side. We have a media where money and corporate influence is really the mother's milk. I think you're being a little bit naive if you think that you can take a pop at a big multinational and expect to walk away without some sort of fight on your hands. So what he's doing here is he's equating your film to a propaganda piece that was trying to essentially justify the massacre of Jews. Vem är det som har skrivit det? Det är Michael Carter på... Uh... Dog. Det kostar många timmar att kontakta så många svenska journalister som de har gjort. De har snart kontaktat hela journalistförbundet. This is serious. This really is accomplishing the objective. Yeah. Shutting down the speech. They spend millions on their brand every year. And you're going to come in and start attacking their brand. What did you think was going to happen? I'm a huge fan of our legal system, uh, but I'm going to take a break from that for today. Yeah, so it was kind of intense for a very long time, almost two years. I was fighting this, the biggest fruit company in the world. And I'm, I'm running a little production company in Malmo, four people. Um, so what happens to a small company if you work 24-7 defending yourself? Um, you lose a lot of money and you bleed. And, 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 and of course they know it. And luckily we had an insurance to cover our, our American lawyers. And I mean, they billed $300,000 to defend us. Um, but we lost at least $200,000. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's a very tough game. Anyway, um, I don't have the time to tell the full story because I actually made a film about the full story. Um, I have a few copies here if anybody wants to buy it because we need money. But I also have a, it's true, I also have a screening here in Oslo tonight, 6 o'clock at Vika Kino, uh, the English version, so if you want to come and see it, you're welcome. Um, but the film is, both films have been playing all over the world. Bananas has been playing in more than 50 countries and, and broadcasted everywhere. And also this film is now doing even better, so in many ways, 
for Dole, it ended up like not a good idea. Um, but at the same time, we had sold the TV rights for uh, Bananas in the US for a lot of money, but they never even broadcasted the film. They were too scared. So in, let's say in, in the US, Dole actually won the war, at, at least up to this point. But now we are releasing the new film in, in the US. Well, being here, I, I, I don't have so much time. So we, we live in a world where journalists or media, classical media, is losing money. And journalists are losing their jobs. And they're also, the ones who are left, are losing their self-confidence. And the PR business is blooming, it's exploding. So there is a shift of power where independent journalists, or I mean, our whole democracies are based on free speech and free press. And, and suddenly the balance is shifting extremely much. The bought, the bought voices, can, can, they can create news, they can create political agendas. So we, I think we're in a quite critical period right now, and we all have to be more aware. Um, if for all of you who work with human rights I, th uh, rights, I think you should consider supporting free voices like documentary filmmakers or artists or journalists so they can keep telling important stories, because your work will, not, it will be very hard to get into media these days, because um, media don't, they don't really have the interest anymore, or not, I mean, media is getting more and more commercial. So we need to support the voices that keep telling stories. I think that's really important. And we have to find a way to, I would even ask for legislation against the media, the PR, the PR people, to at least to create more transparency. So we, can, we have a possibility to follow the money. Um, because, you know, if you go to the website of the PR agency, they don't tell you who they work for. Um, but you can also see in the same webpage that they also have something called crisis management. You can call them 24-7 if you have a PR problem. What is a PR problem? A PR problem is what we create. Most of us in this room, we, we, we create PR problems for, for powerful people. And now they have very skilled experts, experts working for them. Of course, our former colleagues, journalists, former political aides, polit politicians, uh, prime ministers. The guy speaking here, Sven, in, in my film, um, he's a former military for psychological operations for the, for the British Army. I mean, they have all kind of experts. And, and we are facing that, and they are now, as, as, as uh, Nadia told us about, I mean, they are so trigger happy, they're so scared, they, they do, would do whatever they can to protect their brands, and they, they shoot quite quick. So I think what the experience I've gone through and, and Nadia is something that we will experience more if we don't fight back. And we also have to be very good in solidarity. I open with, if we have mighty enemies, you, get, you need good friends. And the, the good thing for me was that I actually, in the end, got good friends. We, the, the, the screening after LA, in LA they told me, Frederick, why don't you give up? Because this film will only get two screenings ever. So why don't you just, don't show it at all? Because it's too hot. I showed a film, uh, I got sued. The second screening was in the Swedish parliament, with, invited by the biggest parties and everybody were there, and we got an amazing support. The people of Sweden started to boycott this company, and we created such an enormous outrage, so the Swedish business had to call Dole and say, please withdraw the lawsuit, and they did. And then we fought it all the way in the US court, and in the end we also won there, so we could we could show our film. Anyway, thanks to be here. Nice, thanks.